Uh, what about the CFR, the Consolidated Federal Register, the U.S. regulations? We know those, right? We've heard of them. Everyone knows 21 CFR parts 50, 54, 56, yeah. um, 312, 314. Yeah, okay, that's what I'm talking about. Those are the U.S. standards. Did you all talk about uh, CF 45 CFR 46, the common rule? Yes, I think so. Good. Okay, the common rule is the basis of where we get our ethical foundations for conducting clinical trials. And in the uh, 2016 uh, Act, um, oh, I just drew a blank on the name of the, the legislature. Um, but in 2016, President, just prior to the turnover uh, of the administration, President Obama signed in a, a law that that um, would force the FDA to harmonize with the common rule. Previously, the common rule was only for federally funded studies. So those were studies that came out of NIH or the National Cancer Institute. And with the 2016 Act that was signed into law, um, the FDA is, and it was now mandated to harmonize uh, with the common rule and follow the same tenets of the common rule. Okay, so that's something we want to keep in mind. And also, most recently, uh, uh, ICH E6 R2, Good Clinical Practice Revision Number Two, has just been coming to force. Also, so everything is is, a, is a changing and harmonizing, and uh, the whole uh, industry is trying to get a grip on getting everybody to do the same thing the same way. Okay, so some things to keep in mind. So 45 CFR, CFR, uh, 45 CFR 46 is the common rule. Uh, 21 CFR part 50 is what? Can anyone tell me what that is? Mm -hmm. Part 50 is human subject protections. Subject protection, 21 yeah. CFR part 11, yeah, is electronic signature. Signatures, yes. Right, 54 is 21. It's, uh, it's, uh, financial disclosure. Uh, financial disclosure. Perfect. This is a little quiz, by the way. Part 56. IRB. Just had that IRB. IRB. 312. I N D. And, yes. And 314. NDA. 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 What about 813? Anybody ever hear of 813? Mm. Throw a curveball at you. Eight thirteen yeah. is for medical devices. Oh, it's that's eight twelve, right? I don't. Eight twelve. Sure. Excuse me. Sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes. It's eight twelve. Yeah, yeah, we don't work in it, so. Right. Yeah. <laughs> eight twelve, eight thirteen. Okay. I'm uh, sorry for the interruption. <laughs> My wife was mm -hmm. letting me know she was going out. All right. Okay. Very good. We need to know the right. I believe that we need to do the right thing in order to protect our participants and our studies. If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have studies. We wouldn't have jobs and we wouldn't have new drugs on the market. Uh, when people ask me, you know, well, why do you do that? Human guinea pigs. I'm like, I asked my friends, I said, would you test a new, would you take a new medication that hasn't been proven safe already? And they're like, no. I said, well, how do you propose we do that? We have to test. Here's another question. Everyone's going to go wild on this one. Um, why, why do we have more rules to protect animals in preclinical trials than we do to have than regulations we have to protect humans in clinical trials? There's more regulations to protect the animals. Why is that? Because we have informed consent and uh, we understand what's happening, uh, we can communicate and yeah, that's mainly and we. Perfect. Yeah. That's perfect, Bendu. Exactly right. Because we have to protect the animals. They're not capable of giving us an informed consent. Exactly right. Perfect. Great. You guys are going to be a good class. So today we're going to start out with the site qualification visit or feasibility, we call it, conducting feasibility. Another acronym would be a pre-study site visit. Now, there's two different types of, of feasibility that I like to talk, talk about. There's protocol feasibility from the site perspective, and there's the feasibility from the site perspective as to whether the site is qualified. 
as to education, training, experience, and facilities to conduct our new clinical trial. Okay? So today, hopefully after this session, we're going to be able to discuss the ob objective of the site classification visit or the pre-study site visit. We're going to elaborate on the importance of selecting a good trial site. You wouldn't choose a dermatology office to run your cardiology study. It just doesn't make sense. We need to elaborate on that importance of the, the importance of choosing a new a, a, a site to, to be in your study is not easy sometimes. There's what we call the Louis Lasagna curve. And I know that sounds funny, but he's a real professor. I think he's passed on now. He was a statistician from the University of Rochester. His name was Professor Louis Lasagna. And he developed a lasagna curve. And it's an upside down bell curve. Okay, so when you first connect with a site to see if they are qualified to work on your study, um, and you talk to the investigator, and if you can figure an upside down bell, a bell up, uh, inverted bell curve, um, they're all giving you, yeah, I can do this study, we can do this, we can enroll 100 patients in your study. But when you initiate them and move into screening, it kind of drops off again, right? And they get nothing. Screening goes on and on, and they can't find any eligible participants for the study. Uh, study chugs along. By the way, 80% of all studies are delayed because of poor enrollment. Okay, so qualifications are most important, all right, to sites, qualifying sites. But at the end of the study, when you go to close them out, the doctor said, well, if your protocol had this, I would have been able to enroll so much more. So it's kind of like an inverted bell curve. So they start out with high expectations, it drops and kind of chugs along till the end of the study. And when you talk to the PI at the end of the study, but if you had done this, well, we've done that, and the curve goes straight back up to the top again. Okay, so that is a true, you can do a Google search for Dr. Lewis Lasagna and get his uh, lasagna curve theory. We're also going to talk about the preparation required by the CRA before we conduct a pre-study site visit and also talk about the activities that we're going to conduct uh, while we're at site, okay? Any questions so far? Any comments? Um, please feel free just to speak up or write something in the chat. I'll try and keep my eye on it the best I can. So, okay, um, after we get all of our regulatory paperwork in, we've submitted to the, well, in, in this case, a, a central IRB, um, we've gotten from the site um, a feasibility questionnaire completed. We've probably gotten a CV from the uh, investigator and the lead coordinator. We're not really going to collect a lot of documents at this visit because the state doesn't know if they're going to participate yet. And they're not going to want to jump through a bunch of hoops in order to um, meet the requirements of your pre study site visit. Again, I tell it like it is. I like to develop really good relationships with my sites. Because when it comes to crunch time, database lock, and you need that last query addressed and resolved, if you have a good relationship with your coordinator, you can get anything done on time. Okay? So once all the paperwork is in the regulatory, the sponsor looks forward to execution of the trial. The potential site is required to implement and dispense the new investigational product. The success of the study solely depends on the right selection of the PI and the site, and I agree with that. Qualified investigator is a good fit. But getting a good research facility with all the required infrastructure, resources, and patient pool is preferable. This is actually needed. It's not just preferable. We need to have that. You have to think about that. Are we doing an outpatient study? Are we doing an inpatient study? How complicated is it? Is it oncology? Is it critical care? Is it an antibiotic study? We have to choose the right sites in order to participate in our study. Okay? That's what we're going for here. So, the objective of our, our pre study site visit or qualification visit is to ensure the potential investigator and the site personnel are qualified as education, training, and experience. And also, do they have the correct and adequate facilities to conduct the trial? If we're doing an EKG, do they have an EKG machine? Um, is the PI capable of reading and interpreting an EKG? Some, some may not be so good. Some or others are good. Is the sponsor going to require a cardiologist overread of the EKG? Something to consider. 
Feasibility is a two-way street. Not only is the sponsor deciding if the site is feasible for participation, the site needs to conduct feasibility to see if they can actually work the protocol for the sponsor. Okay, do they have all the right equipment? Do they need x-rays? Is there a CAT scan available? Do we need a treadmill for a stress test? Whatever the case may be for that trial, um, there's a two-way feasibility from the site's perspective and also from the sponsor's pers perspective. These slides are written from the sponsor's perspective. I'll try and include the site perspective also. Uh, ben, dude, did you say you were, who was the coordinator? Janky, I'm not sure who it was. Me, Bindu. Bendu, okay, good, right? When you got a new study at your site, you have mm -hmm. your own feasibility to look at. Can we do the study? Do we have the patient population, et cetera, et cetera? Yes, it's very, very, very necessary because uh, some some uh, studies are very demographic uh, specific. So we need mm -hmm. to see if we have that uh, kind of uh, a patient pool and if we can actually take in uh, uh, the study and you know continue it for maybe uh, two years or three years uh, as the study demands. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so that's that. That's the site feasibility side. Well, uh, although the uh, these slides are geared to more from the sponsor's perspective, but I wanted to make sure everybody understood. There's two types of feasibilities here. Okay. Thank you, Bendu. Bendu. Uh, from the sponsor side, we need to ensure that all the site personnel, investigator, and site meets all the applicable regulatory requirements to participate in the study, and also to ensure that we have the right patient population. Okay. Again, according to Scripps, Tufts, Tufts just came out with this one. Tufts Institute just came out, and and many others. Uh, Scripps Institute will come out with this. Any other uh, given organization will tell you that 80% of all clinical trials are delayed due to lack of enrollment. And that is a challenge. 